Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. I am so happy to be back with you guys. I know I took a break for it for a period of time and didn't exactly say when I was going to come back, but I really missed y'all. I missed doing this show and I, and as I was watching wrestling, I was still enjoying everything that's been going on. But at the same time, I, there was so much that I had to say about so many different things that I couldn't just hold in anymore and so many good things. Things have been happening to me as well in terms of the podcast and everything. This is season two, and I'm so grateful to be at this point to have reached 30 episodes of my first season and now to start the second season off with an amazing, heavy, heavy hitting episode. (laughs) So, of course, I got your news and gossip ish, and then I have a special interview with the one and only hot topic right now former nwa women's champion thunder rosa and then i have your weekly recap of all your favorite wrestling shows so sit back relax and enjoy this new 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 episode of the hardy wrestling podcast with your girl stephanie hardy i'm back Okay, so I have a power pack news and gossipish for you. So there's a lot that has happened in the wrestling news landscape for the lo- for like all of this time, and I'm just gonna discuss everything you know as it comes. So the first thing on the docket is Matt Riddle and his name change. So, um, on social media, someone took a picture on WWE.com and noticed that Matt Riddle's name had been shortened to just Riddle. And a lot of fans were very unhappy with it because WWE has a um, thing for shortening a lot of wrestlers' names because they did the same thing for Cesaro because at first his name was Antonio Cesaro and then they did it for Big E because when he first came up, his name was Big E Langston, but then they just shortened it. And then for Rusev, who's Miro now in AEW, he was Alexander Rusev, but then they shortened it to Rusev. So now it seems that Matt Riddle is getting that same treatment. Um... <clears throat> And he's just going to be called Riddle now. But he talked about it on Twitter and said he didn't have an issue with it. He said, um, and I quote, people, it's okay. I've been called Riddle most of my life. I actually prefer it. And it's my real last name. Hashtag bro, hashtag stallion, hashtag Riddle in all caps. So he was okay with it. It seems like if he's okay with it, then maybe we should be. But at the same time, um, I'm going to always call him Matt Riddle. It's the same way with Bobby Roode. When they changed his name to Robert Roode, I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like it because calling him Robert Roode is almost like trying to make him like seem more proper than it actually is. And it's just longer to say than just Bobby Roode. So I'm going to call him Bobby Roode for the rest of my life. So I'm going to call Matt Riddle Matt Riddle for the rest of my life. And they even did the same thing with Andrade. Like he was called... Um, he was Andrade Cien Almas her for his entire run in NXT. But then when he came up to the main roster, they shortened it to just Andrade. So it's just kind of a little bit annoying because when you get comfy, comfortable and used to someone's name being what it is, they just change it all of a sudden. You're just like, God dang. But anyway, um, there seems to be a plan going on backstage to have him a, to give him a more serious character presentation. So I don't know if he's going to still come out with his original bro type of thing or if it's going to be like a different, you know, um, heel turn type of thing where he's just a more serious MMA fighter with that background. Who knows? But we'll see. Um, I know that lately since he's been on television, he's lost a lot of matches. So and now he's moved from SmackDown to Raw now. So we'll see what happens. Also in the news, Big E gave Daniel Bryan credit for his for um, advocating for his singles run. So um, if you may or may not know, when the WWE draft happened, Big E got put on SmackDown and Kofi and Xavier got put on Raw as the Raw Tag Team Champions. This is the first time the New Day has been separated from each other in six years. And it took a toll on them, clearly, and it took a toll on us. But, you know, they're still going to have their New Day personas, as we can see. Um, But Big E said in an interview um, with on the Gorilla Position show that um, Daniel Bryan aided in the decision to push him as a single star. He said, I have to give credit to Daniel Bryan because um, because the run um, was from him. Like Daniel Bryan is the reason. 
um he's not just like hey biggie but like he's actually a part of the process and he's the one who said hey this is what we should do with biggie so he's been behind that and for that i'm really grateful and it's kind of funny because biggie um not biggie but daniel bryan is still you know wrestling himself but he said on talking smack two weeks ago that this might be his last run as a wrestler because he enjoys being home and being a father to his two children with brie bella and stuff so this might be his last run as a singles competitor but he's going to use his you know influence and his power to sort of you know give a leg up to to the newer superstars you know who actually need that push because he actually just had a really good match with Jay Uso last night on SmackDown to qualify for the Survivor Series you know men's team and um since he's behind Big E sort of getting this um singles push for all we know this might lead to Big E getting a push towards the Universal Championship which is something that I'm definitely gunning for because baby he deserves to go for a championship at this stage and and he also deserves to not have to wait as long as say Co as, as say Kofi Kingston did which was 11 years so if Big E is gonna run for it then I hope he runs with the quickest of ease to that Universal title but who knows what'll happen during that time so also in the news um is the noted absence of nxt from the survivor series um pay-per-view so after hell in a cell ended um on raw this week they sort of did the full-on push towards what's going to happen for survivor series and it seemed that they were only talking about raw and smackdown participating in it and not um and not NXT and a lot of people were very upset about that because after Hell in a Cell ended we were really excited about the idea of all these triple threat matches that would take place with all these champions it's like say for instance if NXT were participating you would have the match between Asuka the Raw Women's Champion Sasha Banks um the Smackdown Women's Champion and Io Shirai the NXT Women's Champion and that would have been amazing but NXT is not participating in Survivor Series this year like they did last year and a lot of people were mad but there was a statement released by um Dave Meltzer um, of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, he said one of the reasons that WWE is trying to keep NXT talent away from Raw SmackDown talent is to lessen the risk of spreading COVID-19 um, between the groups. And he also reported that apparently WWE doesn't want to present NXT as being on the same level as Raw SmackDown since it usually loses the ratings battle with AEW Dynamite on Wednesday nights. Now, I doubt if the ratings thing has anything to do with it because last year, you know, NXT... Um, um, was competing with AEW for ratings but at the same token they weren't really as focused on it you know now well then as they are now per se and I doubt that that has anything to do with it because NXT is always going to be one of the strongest brands that WWE has like that's never going to change and that's never going to change how we see it how the fans see it or whatever and that's not going to lean into why they can't participate in a big four pay-per-view so I'm leaning more towards the COVID-19 being the reason as to why they're not participating in it and I'm sure it also has to do with the fact that the NXT champion Finn Balor can't participate because he's still dealing with his injury um on his jaw that came from his match with kyle o'reilly from the last takeover that they had so it's kind of it kind of sucks that nxc can't participate this year but if they're trying to keep people safe then i completely get why wwe is doing that because they don't want to run the risk of getting people sick you know when they have to do hand-to-hand -hand combat like that it's a risk anyway the fact that they're doing it anyway but just the fact that you know if they want to keep nxc people from getting sick and all their other superstars from getting sick then i totally understand why it's sad but you know you have to make adjustments to everything as we all have had to do these pat this entire year so there we go also in the news we have wwe and netflix partnering to make a documentary on vince mcmahon so um if you're a wrestling fan or even if you're not a wrestling fan you know that vince mcmahon is probably is actually <laughs> not probably the ceo of wwe and he's been running this company for so very long and now they're gonna make a whole story about him and everything with a documentary it's set to be they announced it um during their quarter three earnings call with investors on wednesday and that it will be produced by wwe and bill simmons who also worked on hbo's 2018 documentary on andre the giant which was really good 
Um, Chris Smith, who directed the um, Fire Festival documentary on Netflix, was going to direct the project. And of course, you know, if you watch WWE television over the last 20 years, he portrayed, you know, the evil boss dude to um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was like the anti-establishment, you know, discontented worker kind of person in their in their feud in the 90s. And in real life, there's a level of substance that his story has as a rags to riches story because he was able to pull himself from poverty in North Carolina, coming from a trailer park um, and an abusive um, and an abusive relationship with his stepfather. And now his net worth is about one point eight billion dollars. So there's a story there as to how he was able to pull himself up from that type of upbringing to become, you know, one of the most polarizing figures in all of wrestling today. Um, so I think that's going to be a really interesting documentary to sort of put forth into the atmosphere. And then there's all kinds of different rumors that people hear about him about not liking it when people sneeze and whether or not, you know, he likes burritos or whether or not he knew what those were at a certain point. You know, there's a lot of story to tell and there's a lot of story to go into with his wife, you know, Linda McMahon, who has delved into politics a little bit and also his two children, Shane and Stephanie. So that's going to be really cool to see. Also in news of gossipish, we have the debacle of Booker T and his opinions on Sasha Banks and how it made everyone feel this week. Now, as a black woman, I will say that hearing a lot of the things that he has had to say over the past couple of months about black female superstars like Naomi and Sasha Banks has been kind of disheartening to say the least. Because you would think that someone, you know, who has a wrestling school in Texas and stuff would have positive things to say about black female wrestlers. But at the same time, I feel like a lot of what he had to say about Sasha Banks having an attitude, you know, and her coming off as, you know, rubbing him the wrong way because of her attitude was kind of counterproductive because that's how a lot of people see black women anyways like they sort of there's this stereotype in society that black women are angry and that we always have an attitude and that we always have a problem with something and all of the above um even when it's warranted for us to be angry about something or have an attitude there's just this stereotype and this stigma and i feel like him using those words could have been damaging but as it turns out it may seem that this was all a work just to get people riled up um about their supposed feud on social media with each other because of course during the time in which Sasha Banks and Bailey were a tag team they would say stuff on Twitter like oh we're better than the Hart Foundation or we're better than Harlem Heat and I think he was just trying to egg that on a little bit and was all like yeah well you're not better than me and my brother and all this other stuff because he started off in a tag team with his brother Stevie Ray and Harlem Heat and WCW and they had massive success back in the 90s and stuff but you know Know, Sasha and Bayley were just kind of hamming it up and you know saying they were better than all the great tag teams of the past and he may have you know said this stuff and said that he didn't like Sasha Banks or her attitude rubs rubs him the wrong way because she thinks she's the best female wrestler ever and he said oh well she passed the test she's supposed to you know think that about herself but he said but he went on to say in that same interview where he said that on his podcast that she is a special talent and that he appreciates what Sasha brings to the table and you have to be able to go out and make people feel a certain way and Sasha has the ability to do exactly that and he also appreciates her willingness to push the envelope with her last two um, Hell in a Cell matches against Becky Lynch last year and Bailey this past weekend. And he said that she's not afraid to throw caution to the wind and that she's willing to put it all on the line inside the square inside the squared circle and that she appre he appreciates that storytelling and that she's a great storyteller and that he's not going to deny that she's one of the best female talents that the company has ever had. Um, so it looks like them beefing was a work <laughs> so I think I'm just not gonna worry too much about it and sweat too much about it but what I will say is that I would hope that black wrestlers of the past will also 
support you know black wrestlers of the future especially you know the black female ones but definitely just support each other because in a white male dominated industry it's important that we you know sort of celebrate each other as opposed to tearing each other down and stuff because there was a report where he may have said some negative off kilter things about jazz um the le wrestling legend jazz in the past and i appreciate shantice from talk of champions you know bringing that up you know in discussing why he would say something Thing, you know like he said about Sasha Banks but I'm hoping that it was all a work and that we can all support each other you know in our endeavors also in the news and this is the last thing is Paige and her passionate plea um to not get rid of the twitch account that she has created um online so here lately over the past couple of months there's been a back and forth between whether or not WWE should get rid of their twitch accounts that their superstars have because you have superstars the likes of AJ Styles and Zelina Vega and also um Paige who have their Twitch accounts to connect with video game you know fans who are also wrestling fans or who may not be wrestling fans you know and they connect that way with their chats and stuff and then as it turns out you know they had to take off their stage names and sort of you know make another name for their twitch accounts and stuff like that but now it seems as if you know since this is the end of october they've reached their deadline and now they have to suspend their accounts for now and Paige, um in an on twitch you know had a whole lot to say about it and she was very upset and here's what she had to say during you know that twitch that she had she said i've honestly have gotten to the point that i cannot deal with this company anymore i broke my effing neck twice for this company they don't realize that this company isn't about sub subscriptions dude we've built such a wonderful community where this is an escape for a lot of people including myself i can't wrestle anymore i was worked so hard in wwe that i can't wrestle anymore she talked about her neck injury and how um she got her dreams taken away from her and that she had to have something that fulfilled that huge void that she lost with wrestling and she found something that even filled a little bit of that void and twitch was doing such a wonderful thing for her and if you're wrestling every day um, and doing these shows every day, that's fine. But I'm an injured wrestler. I cannot wrestle anymore. I get used for media stuff sometimes. But at the end of the day, I'm in my house and I'm going crazy. I need something to keep me sane. And Twitch was my escape from that. And she said, even though she appreciates, you know, her tenure with WWE and the job that she still currently has, um, she doesn't believe she's being treated well because as you know or may not know she was general manager on smackdown for a little while during the first brand split that they had but then once they ended that sort of brand split you know they kind of took her off television and you would only see her every now and again and the last time you really saw her a whole lot was when she was advertising the biographical movie that they made called fighting with my family and then after that you really didn't see her that much so it's kind of sad that she's having this thing taken away from her and that the other wwe superstars who have this have gotten this taken away from them but aj styles was saying you know in his statement that this isn't goodbye this is just to see you later so hopefully wwe is coming to you know some type of agreement with the stars for them to continue to do that because connecting to the video game universe is proven very lucrative as you can see with xavier woods is up up down down youtube channel which i do recommend you know if you're not a video game person but you are a wrestling fan you can watch wrestlers you know do their video game thing but then if you're not a wrestling fan but you love video games you can watch them do that and then you can be introduced to wrestling in that way too so here's hoping that they can find a way to help them you know connect to those fans and be able to continue to make that money that way and that's all for news and gossipish. And now we're going to go into my interview with the absolutely amazing former NWA women's champion, Thunder Rosa. Hello. Hello, Thunder Rosa. Hey, you can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, good. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, I just got out of like practice, so I was just like downloading this thing real quick, and I was like, oh my god. Oh, well, it's okay. Thank you for coming on to my show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I'm gonna start with the one question that I ask all my guests. I'm gonna ask you, when did you fall in love with wrestling? When I was old. When I was 26 years old, I'm doing a podcast. 
since my husband is asking. We just we all just got here from the gym. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I was like 26, 27, and that's when I'm like, all right, this is this is what I'm gonna be doing for the rest of my adult life. Pretty much. Okay. Well, what exactly made you want to pursue it as a career? When I actually started making good money, more money than what I was making at my real job, that was like, uh, it's, there's some good potential here to um, make a good living out of it. I mean, I knew it was going to be hard, but but I knew it was not going to be impossible. Right. Okay, so what was training and wrestling like? And did you have any past fighting skills that helped you transition into wrestling well? Sure. You were just talking about how you um, did just come from practice. So um, how, like, how did you, if you ever had any fighting skills, how did you like incorporate that into your wrestling career? Girl, hell no, I didn't have nothing. <laughs> nothing, I was just like, all right, I can roll, okay. No, it was everything, was, everything was learned just like I did everything else. Like when I was older like um that's when I started like trying different sports when I turned 18 19 when I went to mm-hmm. so that's when I did sports and then when I did professional wrestling it was it, I learned everything from scratch and the MMA came when uh last year when I was 33 so I didn't have no experience whatsoever okay now, I did notice a few days ago you made a post on social media about paying your dues by working and doing um, ringside camera work in a promotion that you had worked in. So what other jobs did you do in the independent wrestling circuit to pay your dues before you were able to hit the ring? Ring crew, security, cleaning bathrooms, taking the tickets, um, ring girl, food, anything. Pretty much any every position. Except okay. Booking a show. That's before booking a show or like stuff like that I wasn't in charge like but um pretty much everything like um yeah everything okay so I believe that may have given you like a well-rounded um experience there oh yeah absolutely that you know has me uh thinking about the business in a very different way than um a lot of people usually or might think about it and just like in the squ- like they only I feel I feel like a lot of people just focus so much on the square circle and then I'm focusing on all the other aspects of, of what a show entails. Yeah, it's definitely a lot more than just the athleticism, that's for sure. There's so much that goes into it. So how has the culture of independent wrestling treated you going forward? Um, <clears throat> well, it's I, I've been in, in, in the independent scene for, Jesus, six years now, actually. This is my sixth year. October marked another year of my career. Um, it was it was difficult at the beginning. I think it's like you have to find your niche, and then you have to find um, like the respect. Because I feel a, a lot of women, especially women of color, we struggle a lot more than some of our uh, people that we work with. And um, and it was it's always been like an uphill battle. To like mm-hmm. expect and earn a spot and then once you are there like you have to like work so hard to maintain it right I imagine that it would be like I've heard like a couple of stories where it might have been harder for for women to sort of go forth and pursue it but I feel like you know once you know that that's what you want to do and you know you don't want to give up then that just gives you the motivation to just keep pushing and keep going I, so I mean this business is this the sign for men is run by men it has been run by men for the last 100 100 years right uh, the the women troops were managed by men and they were booked by men so of course you know they will find a way to like weed out the ones that are not gonna make it and that's what usually happened a lot of the girls that sign up with me or sign up at the same time that uh, i started school they never finished the, the course and they never really like pursue it all the way because it's hard I mean it's, it's it's a grind when you don't know anybody and you're trying to get an opportunity it's a lot of traveling it's a lot of like knocking on doors it's a lot of no's it's a lot of sleeping on people's floors like not knowing where the next place that you're gonna be sleeping in like a lot of that stuff a lot of the unknowns and a lot of people are very uncomfortable I, there was a one point in my career I think it was like my second or third year in my career this is when I was in Lucha Underground 
because I was still looking for opportunities at Thunder Rose and not Discover Moon. Um, my one of my best friends, he called me a gypsy. I literally like lived out of my suitcase. Wow. For weeks, I would just go to like Chicago, New New Jersey, um, Mexico, like anywhere that they will they will let me like stay at somebody's place. Like, L.A. Like I used to go to L.A. a lot. I used to live in Oakland. Um, anywhere that they used to like, give me a place, I'll go and stay. Because why? Because I wanted to get an opportunity. I wanted to be seen. And I know people are not gonna fly me. That was for sure. They made it very clear. But you know, sometimes you gotta invest in yourself, and that's what you gotta do. Right. And going into that question, how you brought up, you know, being a woman and being a woman of color, I want to ask you, um, is representation definitely important to you, you know, as a woman of color wrestler? Absolutely. I mean, I preach about it all the time. And now with a, with a, a company that I own, Mission for Wrestling, representation is one of the most important things for me as, as a woman of color in this business. Uh, I don't think there is enough representation in the main mainstream company there's always the same thing always 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 and always the same people get the opportunity uh in the meantime you see people that are very talented that are just in the back burner all the time and even when they complain they're kind of like oh whatever I mean, they're always complaining no they're not complaining i mean we all have the same right to to ask for an opportunity and to be you know to, to be on top i mean we shouldn't be held accountable or be like, oh my, my gosh, she's being a bitch, you know? No, just, we're asking for what we deserve. Um, but, you know, I, I, I always preach that to like the girls, especially the young girls, and just tell them that like, it is important that we as women, and especially women of color, that we show that we deserve a spot, that we deserve to be respected because we work hard. And I will just speak about the girls that I work in Texas. All of them work really, really hard. A lot of them, the girls that we've been working with for the last couple of months, they work really, really hard, and and they're and they said always stay humble. But when when you see that there's something unfair, you need to you need to speak up, right? So uh, I think that's important too because people need to respect us. And I actually respect everything that you've done in that aspect because when I was watching some of your matches um, from the past few years, I love watching your entrances and how one of them have were actually to a Selena song and I love her. And I was just like, man, this is so cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and I just I just appreciate your pride in your heritage. Like, I love it so much. I mean, you got to represent. I mean, I'm Mexican-American. Um, and I say that proudly. Even the flag that I have is a Mexican American flag. I was born in Mexico, but I, w- I was born and raised in Mexico. But I'm, United States is my country. I live in the United States. I love the United States. If it wasn't because I'm a citizen now, I would have never been able to like achieve some of my wildest dreams. You know that I'm like right now that I'm living as a professional wrestler, as an entertainer. Um, and uh, I'm really blessed to, to do that. So that's why it is important for me to represent all. Okay, so I want to switch gears and ask you, um, as you know, you know, there's the pandemic that's happening and affecting everyone. Um, how has it affected you this year in terms of work and how have you been able to adjust to it? I, I, you, I had to adjust first month, boom, YouTube. Stay connected with the fans, stay connected with, you know, showing them how, what am I doing? Like, my, like do blogs with my dog, with my family. Uh, exercise blogs, uh, any type of blog that I could imagine. Uh, then uh, I open a website in order to still like be able to sell merchandise, physical merchandise, and and, and send it. Since I didn't want to do the Patreon part, um, then we were able to do a lot of studio wrestling during the months of May and June. Mm-hmm. So that really helped us. And then in July, I finally pull the trigger and I said well let's start our custom matches uh, company which is part of Mission Pro Wrestling too and we started doing uh, custom matches and we had like six people and we all had like our little two three matches and we make extra money from that and then we just I just been doing things like that that one is gonna keep us all safe that nobody's gonna be you know um it, when when I do a custom match I make sure like all, all our girls are tested for COVID is very that mm-hmm. everybody stays safe and, and healthy because if somebody's sick, you know, it's gonna affect absolutely everybody that is around them. So that's super important to me. Um, and then we rebrand Mission Pro Wrestling 
and now we're running shows that are run by women which is really cool like our ring crew all all of us put the ring together the ticket ladies the the camera photographer the agent the booker the referees the commentators everybody is oh, it's a moment so it's really interesting what I was able to do during the COVID that sounds amazing how you were able to create this create this um, atmosphere where there are mostly women working and you're also you know seeking to test and keep people healthy during this difficult time I know it hasn't been easy on anyone no it hasn't and the thing is like it is so important to adapt to your environment um so for me that that's what it was it was like we were throwing a lot of ideas of things that we can do while we were here and i mean we're still throwing ideas i mean um uh, we we are going to be working on other projects that are really good that we will be announcing them really soon and um, i'm working really hard right now on uh, doing a lot of photo shoots a lot of content for other stuff so i can get another uh, source of revenue I'm, I mean, you have to be ready for things like this to happen. We don't even know when it's going to be, the country is going to be open again. So there might be another, you know, shutdown for what we know. So we got to be ready. Yes. So I want to ask, um, since you've wrestled for so many promotions like Lucha Underground, like you mentioned, and also um, All Elite all elite Wrestling and so many different promotions, what have been some of your greatest experiences in these promotions? If you don't mind. Um, well, all of them have positive and negatives. I usually focus, even when there's a, there's a negative one, I focus on the life, the life lesson. Like I used to tell the kids when I used to be a, a, in, in the rehab facility, like when you have like really crappy days and, and crappy things happen, it's like, just take this as a life lesson. What did you learn from it? Right. Right. <laughs> so I'm sorry. So definitely in uh, working in Lucha Underground, uh, working in uh, AW pretty much working at every single company except WWE, you know, has taught me like about politics, about uh, people's um, dynamics, groups dynamics, um, how to, you know, stand your ground, how to uh, advocate for yourself when you have to, um, how to advocate for others too. Like mm-hmm. important when you see something that is not right happening. Um, and ultimately, like, it really helped me to, again, bring it back to Mission Pro to do something something completely different with my company. Something that I, you know, I wanted to see that I didn't see in any other companies. And and, and then change that, you know. It's, <coughs> it's so important. I, I, we, do, we, also, we always talk about we want change, we want change, we want things to change, but nobody wants to do the work. So right. it is important when you have the means and you have the vision and you have the drive just to do it otherwise you know somebody else is gonna do it and you're gonna be like man i wish i would have done it and like honestly with this with mission pro like we are doing it and it's it's happening like so quick and and in such a positive way that even when i'm having like really hard days i'm like no this is this is what i was put in this this world and it was to make an impact on 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 other people's lives and now it's like women of different sizes colors backgrounds and everything and and it's i'm i'm amazed by by how the camaraderie that is this is becoming because um a lot of the a lot of the women haven't worked in months because of the pandemic and what we're doing is creating not only jobs but hope that we Mm. can even in this very difficult times we can do something for ourselves and we can move forward and we can um stay positive Especially right. if professional wrestling is your passion is, and is what drives you. Um, I, I can't tell you enough. Like, for example, my friend um, La Rosa Negra, she was on the show for a long time. And I told her, hey, I have a show. Are you interested in coming? She was like literally one of the first ones that wanted to come. In. And ever since she wrestled on September 19th, when we had our first show, she's just like text me every day. It's like, I can't wait for November to happen. I can't wait for November to happen. Cause she's so excited. Just the fact that she's she's around people that she was able to make really decent money that she was able to like just have that connection with the fans again it just brought her life and um and we're working on something really amazing um we're actually going 
I'm going to Puerto Rico to work with some of the ladies out there. So to like, you know, spread the gospel of like how you can be an independent contractor and in times of color, in times of the pandemic, you know, so it's, it's really cool. Like the, the things that you can create when you have a vision and it's a positive vision is not only like, oh yeah, I'm going to make all this money for myself. But it's like let's make change and let's let's, let's create a, a, a real collective of, of women that are willing to to put the work and, and, and do something different for this business to change the landscape of the business. That sounds so inspiring to to me personally because that's kind of almost kind of the same um, mindset I have going into the whole wrestling podcasting game is just to be positive and to know that my vision and to know that my vision is actually you know worth pursuing so that actually inspires me um, to continue to go forward so I appreciate everything that you just said about your experiences so I want to ask you who has been your favorite opponent to face so far and if you have any dream opponents I, I, I answered this question yesterday. It's like, my dream opponent is somebody who's really cool to work with. <laughs> I just want to create magic in the ring and wants to have a kick ass magic. It doesn't matter if it's a five minute, 20 minute, 15 minutes, whatever. It's just somebody who would respect me as a, as a, as a competitor and, and, and just wants to have a good match. Awesome. I respect that. Okay, so. How did it feel to get the opportunity to wrestle for a mainstream promotion like AEW? Uh, I honestly can't tell you. Uh, it, it just happened. They made- <laughs> hey, I'm here. Hello? Okay. You said yeah, it, it just, just happened. happened? Like literally. Okay. Uh, you asked me how did it feel? Oh, I thought how did it mm-hmm. happen? I was like, oh, I don't know. It just happened. I, no, I said, oh, how did it feel? <laughs> don't doubt. Um, I don't know. I wish I would have wrote like every single day that I was in Jacksonville the first weeks, so I could have like say how it felt. It was kind of like, like surreal, honestly. Um, I remember I was taking pictures of the day uh, when we did it all out, and I was just thinking to myself, I'm like, wow, like I am about to be in a pay per view. From one of the major companies in the world, um, I'm gonna wrestle their champion in a 15 minute match, which is very unheard of. Like a lot of the girls don't get a lot of time on TV, and I was able to get time on TV, so it was like I feel blessed, and I feel I was overwhelmed with a lot of these feelings of uh, gratitude um, at that moment. I remember I went that same day I went and, and I went and cried with Dustin just telling him how great grateful I was uh, with life and, and with just the opportunity to be there in such a big arena and such a big stage and that um, that two women of color just as you know Japanese and, and, and Mexican American were gonna be headlining um, in, in a pay-per-view and um as you know, it's just like start looking back at you, at, at your career, at your experiences, like at um, I, at the worst that you've been like when you went to like a small town and you were like wrestling in front of three people. I mean, I was we're wrestling that we didn't wrestle in front of a lot of people anyway because of the whole pandemic. But Drago always mm-hmm. makes a a cameo on on my podcast. Um, <laughs> but um, it felt really good. It felt really really good. I'm really proud of uh, what we accomplished and um, uh, I'm ready to do it again. I'm ready to main event any show. Like I I, I feel like I'm ready and, um, and I just want to keep showing that to the world. Well, I'm ready for you to do more because seeing you wrestle is definitely like one of, like I feel like I'm looking at one of, one of the greatest, you know, in all the professional wrestling, like right now, like I love it. So I definitely look forward to you doing a whole lot more, um, whether it be on television or otherwise, like I'm really excited for you. Um, so I want to ask you, what do you feel about the direction of women's wrestling um, at this stage? It is, I think that um, we as women don't have a lot of say in a lot of stuff. It's all the people that are in power are the ones who still kind of like hold us back. Um, I've seen it in every single company. 
that I worked. Uh, the one that I, it was a little forward, I will say it was Lucha Underground. We did a lot of intergender wrestling, more than one-on-one with female wrestling. And a lot of people were like, well, that was stupid. It's not believable. But honestly, it was like the most progressive thing I've seen in all the... Mm-hmm. Um, I still like, it really sads me that I still see like three, four minute matches on TV. But I understand, again, I always preach that if we want time on TV, if we want to be respected on national on a national level, we have to perform on a national level. The matches need to be great. It has to be good storytelling. It has to be crisp and it has to be good. Otherwise, again, they will be like, eh, you know, like let's just, you know, let's give them like five minutes so they can feel like we're we're being equal. But it's that's important. Like as as women, as as athletes, as performers, we need to uh, we need to perform. We need to perform, and we need, right. we need to demand that respect, and we need to demand that, that those spaces that we deserve. At least when I speak, I speak it for myself. And this is how what I tell people that I train. This is the people I tell that I when I'm when I run. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like blank now. Uh, when you know just people that I teach and people that I uh, uh, I coach or whatever whatever I really tell them that I'm, I'm a very big advocate on that and, and I'm, t- I'm telling you MMA has taught me that you're not you're never gonna get a win if you're like doing things halfway you're just not right so it is very important that when you go and train that you give your all because how you train is how you're gonna have your matches and and uh, it's it's really hard sometimes to like pass that on to like people that you're teaching because everybody has a different drive and my drive out how always mean you have to succeed you have to excel um i'm very i'm very critical of myself especially now even more at the level that i am i'm not i'm not i, I don't i don't want to plateau i don't want to feel like well you know i got a name now i got followers that doesn't mean absolutely nothing somebody else next week is gonna come and be like oh yeah she's a flavor of the month uh see see where i'm going so it's so imp- me that yes. we as women we need to like ask that from the bottom up and um and like again a lot of the, a lot of the things had to do with politics so i i personally don't like getting involved in politics but sometimes you have to mm-hmm. and i i feel like what i'm doing right now with mission pro is a kind of punk rock i kind of like like on the on the side kind of like make just stirring the pot because it is important we need to create spaces that are run by women in order to be like see this is successful you can totally run something successful and don't get don't give me the whole evolution we're gonna do a show one show because it's trending on twitter no evolution needs to happen evolution show needs to happen twice a year right i agree so <laughs> i preach equality I and we're gonna preach yes we gotta do this you gotta like put your money with your mouth is that's it and and to me that's it man like if i'm gonna support anything i want to support something that supports somebody like me and that's a professional athlete that gives everything every time she gets in the ring because i feel there's a lot of talent and they feel that way but they're just again going back to what i was saying earlier they're just on the shelf not doing anything Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I love everything you just That's said. Funny. I'm like, it's. I don't, I don't know if you're like, oh my god, she's getting too political right now. Oh no, not at all, not at all. Like, I love how honest you're being. Like, I just, I'm, I'm just really happy you're being as honest as you're feeling because honestly, when it comes to the women, there's always so much more that can be done, and it seems, and it just really seems like you have such a great passion for it. And I am, I'm a hundred percent here for it. You know, just speak from your, and, speak your truth. And I'm not, I'm not you know? on any company in, in general. I'm not mentioning X, Y, and Z. I'm just saying in general. Um, and I am very yes. outspoken about this all the time because I work really hard. I'm a mother. I'm a wife. I'm a sister. I'm a friend. I'm an MMA fighter. And to me, this is this is my livelihood. You know, if if you have another job, fine, great. I I was there before, but I chose to step out of the regular civil uh, job to become an entertainer. And I want to entertain. I want to have the same respect. I want to earn the same money that my, the male wrestlers do. 
because I can cut promo. Right. I can wrestle. I can fight. I can do everything he does. So, yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love how much you believe in yourself and I just love how passionate you are about women's equality in wrestling. And I feel like, you know, with someone and with with someone and all the multiple people who have or at least multiple women who will have that passion, it'll only grow go up from here. So or at least that's just what I choose to believe. I feel like it can only go up from here as long as we stay passionate and continue to um, apply pressure for better opportunities. So I appreciate that mindset. Um, I have yeah. one last question for you. And it's just, you've won so many championships and competed against some of the greatest talents in the world. What do you think the future holds and, for you? Um. Well, as I was, I was telling you earlier, I'm a visionary right now, and um, I'm so I am totally like dive in on this uh, on production on on creating uh, a new environment with Mission Pro Wrestling and making it a really successful business for 2021. Um, I honestly, like I said, I'm gonna be working with NWA for the next year, uh, and mm-hmm. so that's what the, in terms of wrestling, that's pretty much it. Um, We'll see what the future holds for my my storyline and in, in, in NWA, uh, but um, but I'm committed to teach and coach the new generations of professional wrestlers. Talking about men and women because men need to be on the sidelines with us, supporting us for us to make a change in this business. And I'm talking about not only because of what happened with the Speak Out, but making real change and where like we respect each other as human beings and um right. that we don't feel uncomfortable going to certain places for certain uh promotions and, and and really working with other promoters especially here in this in the state of texas working with other promoters so we can have something cohesive and, and we can if we have issues as as the ones that happened before uh that that you know spark the fire on on my husband and i and my friend to change uh our, and, and rebrand our, our promotion that we can teach them that things can be done right and and we can all work together i think that's that's one of the things that we're doing and 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 like i said i'm i'm really happy to be working with some of the greatest people in the world jazz and rodney mack um they're when they're like helping me mm-hmm. and in terms of like you know there's, again there's a lot of products is changing that mindset and just working together with other people to make the scene better because it's only gonna create more openings for for the people that we're teaching the people that we're coaching the people that we are you know uh putting our time and and um uh i don't know i mean like i said i have like a couple projects that you'll probably know pretty soon once like things get all settled and everything and um but uh but i'm very optimistic for 2021 regardless if we're gonna be struggling still with the uh the pandemic um i'm really optimistic i'm like i said i'm training for mma i'm getting ready for a fight uh, the date is coming up um, probably in the next couple months they're going to give me a date and an opponent so I'm like right now I'm just like focusing my my, my training on staying in shape uh, staying in fighting shape uh, staying in in-ring shape uh, mentally to be the strongest that I can be because no matter what happens no matter what is being thrown at me I, I, I know there's, there's a reason for, for for life to do that and, and, and instead of like complaining and and, and and whining and dragging. Yes, I will complain for like three or four days. But then after that, I will surrender that. And, <laughs> and I will be like, all right, now I got to work harder. Not, not only physically, but like spiritually and mentally. Because that can derail you from for, from everything. From absolutely everything. And all your goals and everything. So that's my, my, my goal for 2021. Is become a better person. A better wrestler and a better fighter. And like those goals that I have said. Like I want to win my, my first fight finally. Pro fight. I because uh, I lost mine last time. Be com- completely continue to be successful in professional wrestling in any aspect. If it's in being a ring announcer or doing any other aspects of, of professional wrestling, that's one. That's one thing I want to do. Teaching, I, I love teaching uh, one-on-ones and, and teaching other people professional wrestling. And uh, and again, pre- preaching the gospel of equality and 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 respect that is very needed and in this business and i'm not just talking about the old school mentality of respect the real respect i respect you as a human being and 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 let's move forward so 
yeah girl I don't know if that's like it's really vague but <laughs> but that's what I'm gonna be working for 2021 actually it's not vague it's a perfect answer and it's the perfect way to end um our conversation i just want to thank you so much for coming on the hardy wrestling podcast i i'm really grateful for this conversation right now like i feel you know really inspired from having us you know connected like this so um is is there anything that you have coming up later that you want to put over or any yeah. or any merchandise or anything let me start with november 6th we have about? our a tournament out of hell you guys can watch it on title match dot com drama network.com or if you are in the texas area and you want to drive you can definitely come to buda, uh, buda texas uh you can buy, purchase the tickets at missionprowrestling.net you can also find our merchandise there uh we're uh, trying to be for next 2021 a self-run promotion so everything all the money that we make on merchandise donations and sponsorships is going back to the, back to what we are working on and you like i said you guys will see what we're working on uh for me uh, you guys can go on thunderosa.net, get all the merchandise there. I have four different teachers right now that you can get. So they're really cute. Um getting new actually I'm getting more t-shirts because I sold so many. <laughs> now, fully. And I have all <laughs> kinds of uh uh eight by tens and everything. I'm working on other stuff for Patreon. I don't know when I'm gonna open it, but I'm gonna open it pretty soon. That's why I've been doing so many photo shoots. And then um, all my social handles are at Thunderosa22. And you can also see me on my old stuff on YouTube and Thunderosa. And uh, thank you for having me here. And I, I, well, again, I want to thank all the fans for being absolutely amazing and for supporting me a thousand percent on every single thing I've done in the last six years. Without them, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Thank you so much, Thunder Rosa. I really appreciate you and your vision, and I hope nothing but great things they will. for you going forward, okay? I'm put- <laughs> All, right. All right. Okay, bye. All right, take care. So once again, I want to thank Thunder Rosa for coming on my show and talking about, you know, her future and her journey towards wrestling and also talking about how she wishes how she wishes to to foster the new generation of female wrestlers and how she's going to go on in her journey. Thank you so much. So now we're going to discuss the weekly recap and we're going to recap Raw, which, of course, took place in the WWE Thunderdome. And we're going to discuss what's going on with the women. So during the elimination tag match between the Hurt Business and Retribution, Mia Yim posed a distraction by scratching a whole lot and, ta- and, a- and acting as if there was something possessing her, controlling her. And that was really weird. And I don't know what her code name is in Retribution. So we're just going to leave that um, for when I discuss the match as a whole. And then also with the women, we had Nikki Cross versus Lacey Evans versus Lana versus Peyton Royce. And they were fighting for a spot on the Survivor Series women's team, which had been announced by Adam Pearce. He announced that the team would include Shayna Baszler, Nia Jax, your women's tag team champions, and Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. So whoever won this match would get a spot on the team. So there were lots of moving parts and everyone was um, fighting each other, you know, without trying to focus on just one person. Um, Lana was able to swoop in and take advantage of Evans um, to get a pin and earn a spot on the team. And this was very surprising seeing as Lana as of late has been kind of, you know, kind of on an up and down streak. She had she was able to become number one contender for the Raw Women's Championship, but wound up losing to Asuka. And then now she's sort of you know bouncing back and winning these matches and stuff you know to sort of earn a spot on this team but then after she earned a spot on the team and Nia Jax uh, offered her a hug she decided to put her to through a table for like probably the sixth time you know and I don't know if this is kind of like a comedy thing where there's always this reoccurring comic spot like they used to do in Looney Tunes and cartoons and stuff like that but it's just kind of getting kind of old because you would think that Lana would learn from her mistakes and learn that um, 
Nia Jax just wants nothing more than to just smash her through a table, but I guess she just never learns. And I don't know if this is a joke, you know, from behind the scenes because they, they're trying to punish her or whatever, but I hope they're not trying to punish her. But at the same time, it just seems like every time she gets an up moment, she gets a down um, moment. And it's just kind of odd. So I don't know what's going on with that. Also, I feel like I felt kind of slighted because it seemed like there were more men's qualifying matches on Raw than it was women's qualifying matches. They just sort of put women there. And that kind of disappointed me at first because I was just like, so y'all aren't going to have qualifying matches. Y'all are just going to like put these people there and then whoever wins this match will just be on the team. And that's just it. Like that just kind of felt lame to me. But then again, there's really not that much you can do with Naomi being out, Charlotte being out and Oscar being champion and her having to face Sasha Banks. So, I mean, hey, whatever. So, but I will say that that did disappoint me as I was watching it. Also with the women, you had Alexa Bliss, you know, participating in the Firefly Funhouse and her sort of debuting her new look as sort of like this fe- this female fiendish character. Because as you know, the fiend has these gloves on that says hurt and heal. Her said play and pain. And she also had these really crazy eyes, you know, like the fiend has that were like orange and stuff. It was definitely perfect for this week being Halloween week. And she also had a moment of bliss and she had Randy Orton on the show and her and um, the fiend were playing mind games with him um, because it seems like they're trying to go after him um, for that WWE title that he now currently holds because he beat Drew McIntyre at Hell in a Cell. So um she was playing games she was laughing and all that other stuff you know because she was luring him in for the fiend to try to beat him up or eat him up or whatever and that's pretty much all that happened with the women which is kind of disappointing because i feel like the raw the raw women's division has kind of been on a struggle bus lately and i just hope that everything can just get better because they really deserve more to do than just to be centered just there's just more that just needs to happen with their women's division So the show started with um, Drew McIntyre coming out, you know, and talking about losing to Randy Orton at Hell in a Cell in a pretty okay match. And then he paraphrased a quote from Rocky where Rocky was talking about, you know, it's not about, you know, winning. It's about how, you know, how hard you get hit, you know, and can get back up because that's how winning is done. And I know I'm paraphrasing here and I know it's not perfect, but, you know, that's what he said. And after, you know, he was talking about that and taking responsibility for losing the match, which I thought was very surprising because, you know, he had a good championship run and he's lost to this dude who's won the title 14 times now. Um, The Miz came out um, and he came out with John Morrison to gloat about winning money in the bank, uh, winning the money in the bank briefcase from Otis, you know, at Hell in a Cell, which upset me. Um, also because Tucker was the reason why Otis lost because Tucker actually turned on Otis and hit him in the head and caused Miz to actually win the match. And it made me sad because I wanted someone new who hadn't had money in the bank to cash it in, but they decided to give it to the Miz. So boo, whatever. And now I guess Otis and Tucker are going to be feuding against each other because they were best friends and now they're not. So Drew McIntyre told him to be careful what he said because he wasn't in a good mood. And then they said that his title reign was impressive, but just like everything, it had to come to an end at some point. And then Miz also talked about how he beat Randy Orton for the WWE title when he had the Money in the Bank contract the last time and he promised to do it again. But but Drew McIntyre was tired of it and he hit Miz with the Glasgow kiss. And then before he could do any damage to John Morrison, the Miz made the save and they ran up the ramp. And then McIntyre said, you know, he'd speak to management and make sure that they'd have a bad night. And he challenged the Miz to a match. So this was a pretty good segment here. You were able to see Drew McIntyre be the brooding guy who's angry at the fact that he lost the title that he worked so hard to achieve. And then you have the Miz out here, you know, rubbing it in his face that he has the opportunity to cash in at that money in the bank contract at any point he could have cashed it in that night but he chose not to but you know it's just so much that you know that was going on in that segment but it was still pretty okay then we had jeff hardy versus aj styles for the umpteenth time and even though they they work really well together and aj styles was definitely smart in working that injured knee that jeff hardy has hardy gang hardy gang it's just the fact that I've seen them wrestle so many times before, especially on SmackDown here lately for the Intercontinental title when AJ Styles had it and when Jeff Hardy had it. It was just kind of like, you know, it was a pretty good match, 
but I was just a little, you know, discontented with it. But to be honest, the best part about that match was the fact that since AJ Styles has a new bodyguard out here named Jordan um, Amagbahin, who hails from Nigeria, um, he had a presence out there that was just undeniable there was a point where jeff hardy you know jump was leaping off of the ro- leaping off of the ring to try to go on to aj styles and jordan caught him midair and it was just interesting to see you know his athleticism and see how you know he's able to move in that aspect so he caught him you know and it was just effortless so he definitely had an impact on the outcome but you know AJ Styles is going to AJ Styles. He's going to cheat. But then also you had Elias smashing a guitar over Jeff Hardy's back and getting revenge on Jeff Hardy because Elias thinks that Jeff Hardy was behind him getting injured in that car accident when we all know it was Sheamus. So since they're all on the same show, I assume that somehow Sheamus is going to get, you know, hit some type of comeuppance for what he did. But I guess Elias just isn't hearing it right now and he just really thinks it's Jeff Hardy. So, uh, whatever. So now um, AJ Styles is on Team Raw for the Survivor Series, for the Survivor Series match. So we're going to go on and Lucha House Party um, was in a match against Drew Gulak and Akira Tozawa. And this kind of passed by really quickly. And I will be honest, there was a point where I didn't necessarily sit and watch this entire part because I was actually in the middle of doing something else. Um, But... I was able to say that I think there's an there isn't an issue with the fact that our truth is out here with the 24-7 title and all the other stuff, but you know, after that point, Drew Gulak and Tazawa was teaming up to take on Lince Dorado and Grand Metalik. Tazawa started with a stiff right hand and Dorado tagged Gulak and then they de- for a double team move and then there was a some but then drew gulak bent dorado backwards over his knee but then lince dorado broke free and hit a face buster but then our truth came running down with little jimmy at ringside and um tozawa tried to pin him for the 24 7 title but then truth kicked out and threw him into the barricade and there wasn't a d de- there wasn't a disqualification which i thought that was very strange because usually when there's an interference you know there's a disqualification there but it wasn't but then everybody's tried to pin our truth for 24 7 title but then dorado was able to pin drew gulak to win a tag match but then truth was finally able to get away so that's really all that happened there it was a whole lot of madness going on then we went on to Elias versus Keith Lee, which I believe was another um, qualifying match for the Survivor Series team. And this match was kind of different because you had, you know, the smaller, more the smaller heavyweight Elias against more of the big linebacker in Keith Lee. And Elias was in the ring and then he gave a promo about his brand new album that had dropped um, that night. And but then once the match started, Keith Lee just went in on him. And he asserted his dominance. He ran over Elias with a running crossbody. And then um, Elias had to take a breather outside the ring. But then the limitless one um, threw him over the announce table. Then they came back from commercial. But then Keith Lee kept Elias grounded in an arm bar. And then Elias countered with a power bomb with a surprising her Karana, which I thought was really cool. And then he followed up with a knee to... Um, Keith Lee's face and then Jeff Hardy's music began to play and then the distraction led to Keith Lee hitting the spirit bomb for the win to qualify for the Survivor Series team along with AJ Styles and then Jeff Hardy gave him gave Elias some payback by hitting Elias in the back with a guitar so I'm glad that Keith Lee as a new superstar on Raw is actually going to be able to participate in Survivor Series this year because last year um, when he participated in Survivor Series for Team NXT and he had that um, face off with Roman Reigns, it was so amazing. So now he gets to assert himself more as a superstar on Raw and I'm really excited about that. Then we had the um, elimination match between The Hurt Business and Retribution. And this match 
irritated me because it just seemed like this is like the second match in a row that Retribution has lost. And they were trying to make them look so dominant, especially in revealing that Mustafa Ali was the leader of Retribution and the guy who was the um, SmackDown security camera dude and him supposedly talking about how they're going to shake up the landscape of Raw. But now they've lost both of these matches you know i'm not really gonna go into what happened in a match but just know that her business won but i was really irritated with retribution you know having to keep losing these matches over and over again but then making themselves look dominant afterward with a promo afterward talking about what they're gonna do and how they're gonna take over and all this other stuff you're not doing a good job of taking over if you keep losing these matches to the hurt business and that's just how I feel about that situation. Like if Retribution is supposed to be meant to be this amazing, you know, faction that's supposed to turn Raw and the WWE Universe upside down, why are you consistently having them lose? And I know that the Hurt Business deserves to have, you know, this big run or whatever, but why are they always losing to them? It's kind of irritating. Like it's really irritating me. Um... Then the Miz and Drew McIntyre had their match. And John Morrison um, tried to provide a distraction early on, but then McIntyre still took control of the Miz and cornered him for a chest chop and some stomps to the body. But then the Miz kicked him in his bad knee, but then it barely, you know, slowed slowed Drew McIntyre down. Um, because Drew McIntyre had had his knee worked in that Hell in a Cell match. Um, but he was still going on and pressing on. And then the Miz took control for a few moments, but then Drew McIntyre started throwing him around the ring with belly-to-belly -belly suplexes. And then he took out Morrison in ringside before he nailed the Claymore for the win. So this was a good win for Drew McIntyre to get, especially bouncing back from his loss to Hill in the Cell. So I'm assuming that somewhere down the line, he's going to want a rematch for his title. Well, not his title, but Randy Orton's title. I'm so used to Drew McIntyre with the title that I'm saying his title, but I'm sorry, y'all. But, um he's going to want a rematch with Randy Orton. So they're going to go into that a little bit later. So that's going to be interesting. Um, then we had a match um, with Matt Riddle versus Sheamus. And this match was pretty good. Um, Sheamus was showing a lot of his athleticism. Matt Riddle was showing off. Um, they locked up and then Matt Riddle um, took Sheamus to the mat with a double leg takedown. And then um, Sheamus rolled out of the ring to regroup. And then Sheamus planted him with a takedown of his own and then applied a modified Kimura lock. And then um, Matt Riddle countered with a gut wrench suplex. And then Sheamus put him on the apron for the beats of the Bodron. And then we came back from commercial break to see um, Sheamus having Riddle grounded. And then Matt Riddle made a comeback and hit the Broton for a two count. And then he hit an Exploder Suplex from the top rope, but still couldn't get the pin because Sheamus just wasn't going to give up. Then Sheamus blocked the floating bro with his knees and began focusing on Matt Riddle's back. And then the former MMA fighter applied a sleeper, but then Sheamus broke the hold and then kicked out of a German Suplex. And then Sheamus drilled him with a bro kick for the win. Now... I feel weird about Matt Riddle being called up and not being, you know, utilized to his best because he's been losing a lot. Like he lost the last time he wrestled on SmackDown and then now he's losing on Raw to an established superstar like Sheamus. Like you would think that Sheamus, you know, would probably do Matt Riddle a favor and then let him go over, you know, and put um, Matt Riddle over. But it looks like that's not going to happen. And maybe... And now that Sheamus is going to be on Team Red, you know, on Team Raw for Survivor Series, this will cause for Matt Riddle to sort of, you know, shake some things up. Because like I said in News and Gossipish, there's the rumor that they're going to change up his character a little bit to be more serious. So here's hoping that Matt Riddle can bounce back, you know, once they've, you know, figured out what they're going to do with him. And Drew McIntyre, after this, Drew McIntyre attacked Randy Orton after his, um, run in with the fiend and even though the fiend was standing right behind um randy orton he went ahead and decided to run towards you know drew mcintyre and they started to you know fight each other while alexa bliss laughed in the background you know on the ring apron and then the lights went out and then when they came back alexa bliss was gone and randy orton was on the ramp and then mcintyre was in the ring by himself but then um the fiend was standing right behind him and then he went by 
he still continued to fight Drew McIntyre and that's where the um show went off so this was a different episode of Raw going after a pay-per-view and hopefully things will get a little bit more organized with you know as they go into Survivor Series and stuff and hopefully the women's division will have a whole lot better going for them going forward and now we're going to recap NXT Okay, so now we're going to recap NXT. This was a special episode of NXT, like it wasn't a takeover. It was Halloween Havoc. So for anyone who watched WCW back in the day, Halloween Havoc is was this um, pay-per-view that they used to have that was centered, of course, around Halloween with a giant pumpkin in the background with all kinds of creepy stuff like ghosts and spider webs and graveyards in the set and everything. So this is what was going on. It was hosted by Shotzi Blackheart, who did a phenomenal job job as a host she was literally she performed a star making performance as the host of the show and she had amazing outfits to start the show she was kind of dressed like a frankenstein kind of character with red boots and like very tight fitted jumpsuit that was sort of made like in like frankenstein skin and then she also had this amazing outfit that was sort of black kind of put you in the mind of um Morticia from the Adams family and then you also had um another outfit that was like a red devil outfit as well she just really you know did up the Halloween thing and it was really cool to see her hair was was on point her makeup was on point she just looked really beautiful and she did a fantastic job as the host so to talk about the women's matches we had two stellar matches by our women you had Rhea Ripley versus Raquel Gonzalez the two big heavyweight women they did such a phenomenal job I love this match Raquel surprised me because the most we've ever seen Raquel Kel Gonzalez do is sort of be the muscle to Dakota Kai, you know, kind of like the diesel to Dakota Kai, Shawn Michaels. So we never really saw her, you know, wrestle a full on match like this before. And against someone like Rhea Ripley, who has all of the experience and is a former NXT UK and NXT women's champion, you know, you thought that. Ra- Raquel wasn't going to show this much but she actually did show a lot of her strength here and it was great she started by asserting her strength advantage early against Rhea Ripley by power bombing her into the glass panel she continued to wear down Rhea with the physical offense with kicks and all kinds of stuff and punches it was crazy but then Rhea Ripley hit her second gear and then she didn't look back um she reversed out of a one-arm power bomb attempt with a head scissors takedown and then she gave a big boot and a rip tide um to follow to to follow and set up the big victory for her like i said this was a great showing from the both of them they slugged each other around threw each other around punched each other and all the above like it was a really good match and raquel gonzalez did an amazing job and i loved her outfit too her outfit was paying tribute to selena um, of course, with her red and white bustier, it didn't have the rhinestones like Selena's did, but it was still really cute, though. And then Rhea Ripley came out with a lot of eyes and teeth on her jacket. So everybody was doing up the Halloween thing. Also, with the women, you had the NXT women's um, title match between Io Shirai and Candice LeRae. And of course, this was a spin the wheel, make the deal match. So once they once they spun the wheel, their match stipulation was tables, ladders, and scares. So this basically meant that there, there was lots of different scary stuff that they could have used, like different body parts, like fake body parts, but you know, fake body parts underneath the ring and all kinds of creepy things that they could have used to win the match. So, um... And of course, you know, they had to climb the ladder in order to retrieve the title and, you know, win it or whatever. And then um, something interesting that happened was the fact that Poppy came out dressed in costume and performed Io Shirai's theme song. And my boyfriend was really excited about that because he loves Poppy. Um, (laughs) So he was just really crunk about that. So they spun um, the wheel and they went right for the ladders and chairs. And this match was really brutal. They were trying to, you know, something that I thought was really impressive, I think is more and more impressive, is Candice LeRae's um, penchant for matches like this. Because it seems like not only is she really good at selling, getting hit, or running into tables and ladders, but she's really good at being very vicious in these matches too. 
And I loved her costume, which also matched Johnny Gargano's costume. They were Jack Skellington and his female love interest in The Nightmare Before Christmas. Don't kill me. I've never really, like, I've watched that movie one time, but didn't watch it all the way through. So I don't remember a whole lot about The Nightmare Before Christmas. But I do know that those, that their outfits were, you know, tailored towards that sort of look. And it was cute. But, um she really they both were really impressive in this match um they did lots of damage to each other um they started fight they finally started setting up ladders you know to retrieve the championship but then Io Shirai missed a moonsault and landed leg first on a steel chair but then Candice LeRae took advantage going after the bad leg of Io Shirai like which is a smart thing to do until Io Shirai planted her spine first on a standing chair and then it got worse for for them as Candice LeRae hit a swinging net breaker on Shirai, Shirai through a pair of tables it was crazy and then um there was a figure in a ghost mask that ran in to help um, Candice Ray, which I could assume is probably Indy Hartwell. But then Shotzi Blackheart stopped her in time. So she wasn't just the host. She actually was able to be like a ram in the bush for um, Io Shirai. And Lorraine was still at the top of the ladder after all of that happened. But then Shirai recovered and knocked her off the ladder through another ladder. And then Io Shirai was able to retain the title and retrieve it from the top of the roof. But this match was really good. And I hope this is the last time that Io and um, Candace fight each other. So, um, yeah, both of these women's matches were really fire. And I was glad that the ladder match, that the tables, ladders, and scares match actually main evented. Because I always love when my women main event um, shows. So the show started with and with the NXT North American Championship match between Damian Priest and Johnny Gargano. And like I said, Johnny Gargano came out dressed in his um, Jack Skeleton gear. And then um, Damian Priest came out, you know, with his regular rock star gear um, and pants. But he came out with a different entrance um, with a live guitar entrance. And I don't and on Instagram, he did say who the person was who played for him. And he stated it was a dream come true that it happened and that there's a silver lining in him um, losing the NXT North American Championship. So this match was a devil's playground match after they spun the wheel. So um, they quickly went for weapons. Um, Johnny Gargano grabbed a kendo stick and then Damian Priest found a night stick. And then they fought each other into the backstage area through the frightening stage props. And Gargano um, used everything, including a garbage can at his disposal. And they battled each other to the stage where the wheel was set up. And then someone in a... And then, of course, I, who I think is Indy Hartwell again, um, attacked Damian Priest with a steel pipe. And then John Gargano smashed a tombstone over... Um, Damian Priest and then knocked him off the stage into a mausoleum and then he was able to get the pinfall victory and now Johnny Gargano is a two-time NXT North American champion so um this happened and I was a little bit disappointed that Damian Priest lost because it felt like he only just won it like maybe a month ago or so but you know Johnny Gargano one of the Garganos has to have a title now so it, I guess it has to be Johnny now I don't know if this is going to cause a rift between him and Candice now but here's hoping that it doesn't so much so to the point to where you know it makes them separate but you know Johnny has a championship Candace doesn't and that's something they're gonna have to you know discuss so there's that then Pat McAfee came out and introduced um the group that's gonna take over NXT so last week Pat McAfee revealed himself to be the guy who interfered and beat up the remaining members of the Undisputed Era and caused for them to not you know be in the running to go for the tag team titles again and he wound up helping Oni Lorcan and Danny Burch win the NXT tag team titles that they definitely deserved, but I didn't think they would win it in such an underhanded tactic. So he stood with them, Pat McAfee stood with them and taunted Undisputed Era, and he told the world that he had originally chosen Ridge Holland to attack them, but he took another option after Holland's injury that he, you know, had with his ankle. And he knew he had the right guys to take over NXT. Then Kyle O'Reilly came out for revenge and um 
he came out by himself, you know, to try to get revenge on them for what they had done. But then Pete Dunn, you know, returned to NXT, you know, and it was a definitely a welcome return. I'm pretty sure everybody was happy to see him in the audience. But then he looked ready to help Kyle O'Reilly with a steel chair because they were both holding chairs together. But he decided to hit Kyle O'Reilly in the back with the chair. And then he revealed himself to be the fourth man in their group. So now Pete Dunne is aligned with Oni Lorca, Danny Burch, and Pat McAfee. So now you can only hope that once the Undisputed Era recovers, it's going to be a four-on-four thing. And there are rumors going around that this is supposed to be a setup for war games, which I absolutely love. And if all of these people are going to participate in war games, they're going to destroy each other. And I am going to love every inch of it. Then we had a short match between Santos Escobar, um, the Cruiserweight Champion, and um, Jake Atlas. And this match re- went relatively quickly because Legado del Fantasma came out with him um, and helped him cheat, you know. And the Phantom Driver ended the match really quickly. And I thought this was kind of disappointing for two people who could probably go a little bit longer, but they probably couldn't do that much seeing as they had a whole lot of other stuff to do in the Halloween Havoc theme show. And then also in a package, a video package, you had Ember Moon talking about how um, happy she was that Dakota Kai was able to assert herself and attack her last week because when she had left NXT to go to the main roster, Dakota Kai was afraid of her own shadow and she was getting beat up by Shayna Baszler constantly over and over again. And now Dakota Kai has turned heel and she's trying to assert herself more. So now Ember Moon said that she wasn't afraid of the new Dakota Kai and that they're going to have a good match next week. And I'm really looking forward to that. Um... Then we had a Haunted House of Terror match between Cameron Grimes and Dexter Loomis. And Cameron Grimes was trying to get William Regal to talk, you know, to get him out of the match, you know. And then as he was trying to do it unsuccessfully, you know, he got led to a van um, that was being driven by Michael P.S. Hayes. And he made a statement saying, oh, my God, I hate rednecks. And I was like, oh, my God. And I couldn't believe he said that out loud. And I said, I wonder how AJ Styles feels about that. (laughs) But either way, it was funny. And then um, Cameron Grimes, you know, tried to be confident as he entered the haunted house. But his confidence quickly left as he got, you know, um, stalked by Dexter Loomis constantly. And then he ran into frightening, all, all kinds of frightening zombies and monsters and all kinds of stuff. It was bad. He only got back to the van to see um Dexter Loomis you know in and and driving it but then he began running down the street you know and he ran all the way back to the NXT arena and his zombies crawled towards Cameron you know and he was forced into the ring to finally face Dexter Loomis and then a female zombie climbed on top of Dexter Loomis and it jumped onto Cameron Grimes and then when Loomis tried to you know hit his double stomp he wound up missing and then he planted and then Loomis planted Grimes with a katagame into the silence for the win and it was a technical submission and it was so this match was really good you know if you're into the theatrical stuff it was still it was really good and it was also really funny to see Cameron Grimes who's usually so confident and talking about how he's going to send people to the moon he wound up not sending him to the moon and wound up losing (laughs) so this was just really interesting to see and he wound up losing the match and Dexter Loomis now you know has solidified himself as the creepy guy to kick all kinds of butt so that was really good and that's pretty much all that happened on NXT and now we're gonna recap Smackdown which was really good last night And now for our last recap, we're going to recap SmackDown from last night. Now, in comparison to Raw's Raw's women's division, SmackDown's women's division has been on fire. And I mean absolute fire. When I tell you Bayley and Sasha Banks tore the house down and held the cell for the SmackDown Women's Championship, it was awesome. Like... It was so awesome, and I was just really happy to see that Sasha was able to go in, you know, in her white outfit that was camouflaged, just like her first Hell in the Cell outfit that she had against Charlotte Flair. She went in, and they were vicious with each other. They were, you know, innovative with their with with the weapons that they used. They were calling back to some of their older matches and stuff with the Bailey to Bellies and all that other stuff, and 
also with the first takeover match they had where Sasha was trying to destroy Bailey's arm or destroy her face with the chair to end the match where she won the SmackDown women's title and how Sasha was finally able to win a match in Hell in a Cell because she's lost the last two she participated in. I was on that ride and it was fantastic. So we're going to talk about the women first. <laughs> um there was a qual they actually had a qualifying match um for the smackdown women's team against natalia bianca belair and billy k they were backstage you know talking to adam pierce and trying to sort of force themselves on the team and force themselves to be captain and natalia was saying i should be captain simply because i'm the leader of the women's division and i've been here the longest and blah blah blah, blah. and billy k came came up with a picture of herself with the resume on the back of it saying everything that she's ever done and then Bianca Belair was like well since Survivor Series is the best of the best it only makes sense that the EST should be on the team right so Adam Pierce made the triple threat match and they fought each other and there was a point where during this match um there was a double there was a dual submission that Bianca Belair was suffering at the hands of Billy Kay and Natalia and she did not tap and stuff so um, there was a point where Natalia looked like she was going to get the win on Bianca Belair with her with her spinning clothesline and the move that she does where she likes to slide and punch people and then step on them while she's running and stuff like that. And Billy Kay, of course, was giving the comedy tease that she's known to you know to do um, and stuff like that. But ultimately, Bianca Belair wound up winning with the KOD. And she wound up pinning her, like pinning, I believe it was either Billy Kay or Natalia. I think it was Natalia, but she wound up winning. And now she's the first member on the Women's Survivor Series team. And I'm so happy for her. And her outfit was orange and it was really cute. And it was very, and it was Halloween themed. So it was really cute. Then afterward, they had a Carmella promo. And, and if you may or may not know, Carmella has gotten this new gimmick where she's the untouchable sort of rich girl you know thing and she sort of dropped the whole dancing fabulous gimmick the princess of staten island thing she sort of dropped that and now she's more like this glamorous model type girl and she had her va va voom on she had her hair all curled up with a red lipstick and her red dress with some champagne and she was talking about how next week she's gonna prove why she's the untouchable one or whatever and it was so cute and i was like okay girl come on you know because I listened to her podcast that she has with um, Corey Graves called um, Bear With Us. And that's really lately where I've been getting all my Carmella stuff lately. And it's really good to see her on television with this new gimmick. I'm ready to see what she's going to offer us now. Also with the women, you had um, Aaliyah um, sort of in hat being, you know, in this storyline with Murphy. And now they're romantically linked. And she confessed her love for him after Ray and Dominic were trying to beat up on him after he was trying to apologize. And they're all angry because she sort of turned against him because they don't trust him because he was aligned with Seth Rollins and the whole Monday Night Messiah thing with him for so long. But he's trying to show that he's on their side because he's in love with Leah. But she but something that I did notice is, is the fact that she said, Said she loved Murphy but Murphy didn't say that she that he loved her back I mean they kissed but my thing is love is a two-way street don't love me if you like if I say I love you I need you to say I love you back to me I need you to feel the same way I do so um that that happened and then also with the women, you had Bailey confronting Sasha Banks because Sasha was out celebrating and talking about how she was able to learn that the one person she needed and how she the one person she actually needed was herself. And she needed to tap into that part of herself in order to win that SmackDown Women's Championship finally and take away the one thing that she cared about the most. But then, of course, Bailey, being the party pooper, came out and said that the that that the only reason that she beat her in that match was because Bailey didn't want to sign that contract for it and she and she forced her hand and forced her to sign the contract and she said that she's going to take the title away from her next week Bailey and Sasha are going to fight each other next week for the Smackdown women's title on Smackdown and Bailey was saying that we all know that when it comes to titles you can win them but you can't keep them and that's something that I try to ignore a lot as a Sasha Banks fan is the fact that every time she wins a title with the exception of the NXT women's title because she held that for seven months um before she lost it to Bailey, um, it's like when she came to the main roster, she was able to to win the Raw Women's title four, well, five times 
only to have a short reign of say like a week or two or something like that and it kind of sucks it really sucks because she said one time in an interview with sam roberts that 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 the company had it in their minds that sasha really doesn't need a title to be over whereas someone like say a charlotte flair would need a title to be over but my thing is when you have somebody like sasha banks who is arguably the best women's you know one of the best women's wrestlers in the world it's like you're making it seem like she's only good, you know, for being a flash in the pan and she's not a substantial champion. Whereas you give all these other people substantial reigns who aren't even as good as she is. And it's not fair. Like give her a substantial reign. Like don't just and I'm hoping that they gave her this title, hoping she'll have a good run with it and not just give her the title just because she's on the Mandalorian or something like that. Like the Sasha Lorian deserves to have a title reign that's longer than a week so let her keep it <laughs> i'm very passionate about this but i just want her to keep the title and i'm gonna need for bailey to sit down and just leave her alone and just let her live her best life um like seriously and i believe that's really all that happened with the women um in terms of that but still it was very much more substantial than what's been going on on raw um so the show started with roman reigns and jay uso and Jay Uso is having to sort of, you know, have a come to Jesus meeting with Roman Reigns because at Hell in a Cell, Jay Uso lost because um, Roman Reigns was beating up Jay Uso so bad that his brother Jimmy came out and said, in a very great performance, by the way, this Hell in a Cell match was fire too. Um, he was out there saying, no, you need to stop this. And he was giving an air of reality to it when he said, this is Josh, it's Joss and John, it's Joss and John. You know, we can fix this, we can fix this. And they were crying and stuff. And Roman Reigns was crying and all the other stuff. But then he put um, Jimmy in a te in a, um, in a chokehold and he was waking Jay up to say, hey, you need to help me, you need to help me. But then Jay said, man, I quit, I quit. You know, and Jay Uso last night was saying, you use the one person, he told Roman Reigns, you use the one person person I would say I quit for because that is his twin brother you know and he told him I hate you and then Roman Reigns was like I love you too I love you too but you know you have to fall in line I'll give you to the end of the night to fall in line or else you're out of the family and you can tell that Jay Uso there was like a tug of war going on in Jay Uso's heart it's like he didn't want to submit to Roman Reigns but at the same time he knew he had to in order to remain in the Samoan family but honestly how can you undo blood but anyway <laughs> he wound up giving up you know it was so bad but then Jay Uso and Daniel Bryan had a qualifying match to fight later on in the night to be on team smackdown for the men for survivor series so we'll, we were going to be able to see what happened then then kevin owens and dolph ziggler had a match against each other to qualify for team smackdown and survivor series and this match was really good and um robert rude came out with him bobby rude came out with him and tried to interfere in the match but the referee you know ejected him and sent him away and he didn't come back so they were able to have a fair match and this match was really good here Dolph Ziggler was showing a lot of his strengths you know going forward and Kevin Owens was able to fight back you know through um all of the you know offense that Dolph Ziggler was giving to him and Kevin Owens ultimately wound up winning the match and it was really good um and so now Kevin Owens is on team Smackdown and then Corey Graves had a sit down interview with Lars Sullivan and I didn't care too much about this promo because there's really nothing that WWE can do to make me care about Lars Sullivan, especially since everything's come out about him being a weird, a weird, somewhat racist, somewhat homophobic person who has a very checkered past and I'm just sort of over him. I mean, he was he was trying to give off the impression that he's this scary dude that likes to beat up on people who like to hurt him, which I get. But at the same time, I'm just sitting here like nothing WWE can do will ever make him matter to me. It just won't. So we're just going to skip that. Um, then, of course, there was the segment that Murphy had with Seth Rollins and Aaliyah and Rey Mysterio. And Seth Rollins, of course, was egging on the fact that he that Murphy used to be underneath his wing and that he needs to come back and that he would even allow Aaliyah to be underneath his wing but then he refused and then Seth Rollins sort of left you know 
once Dominic and Rey Mysterio came out there to sort of, you know, beat up on him for taking Aaliyah away. And Aaliyah was just refusing to go out there with Ray, to, to leave with Ray because he said, because like I said earlier, she said she loved Murphy and they kissed and stuff. And as much as people online talk about how much they hate this storyline because Aaliyah is like 19 years old, you know, about to turn 20, even though she's technically still legal, but at the same time, with him being, with Murphy being as old as he is, around 38 or 39 years old, they're still a cute couple. <laughs> I feel bad for saying this. Um, but they're a cute couple and I think, you know, if they're going to be a couple, at least they're going to go all in on it. So, Hey, whatever, but I'm going to need for Seth Rollins to not just be, you know, to just take his Friday night falafel self on somewhere. And then after that, um, the street profits and Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura fought each other in a non-title match. And this match was really good. They were both teams were able to show their strength. There was a point where Cesaro was was being so powerful that he launched Montez Ford into the the, t the virtual audience, and it was really cool because of all because of the height that Montez Ford got. And I just love watching Montez Ford sort of jump around and give all of his clotheslines and stuff because he has so much energy. And I just love his um, frog splash and. Of course, the Street Profits were able to win because it makes sense for management to sort of push them forward because they're going to have to look strong going into their um, Survivor Series match against the New Day in Kofi Kingston and um, Xavier Woods. And they were saying earlier this week that they felt like this is a dream match. Um, and it means the world to me because you have two of these great black black um, male tag teams going up against each other, you know, in Survivor Series. And it's just absolutely beautiful to see those two um, fight each other. And it's going to be great. So um, they won with the cash out. And there was a point where Montez Ford, like he almost hurt himself with the frog splash. So I'm hoping he's doing OK so they can go for it with that match. Um, then to end the night, we had Jay Uso versus Daniel Bryan. And this match was really good. Um, you saw a lot of, of course, you know, the things that we know Daniel Bryan to do with his yes kicks and all of his, you know, submission maneuvers and stuff like that. He did a really good job and Jay actually did a really good job, you know, holding his own in a match against someone of Daniel Bryan's caliber. Um, the story was even furthered even more with Roman Reigns coming out and watching the match in order to see you know how Jay was going to perform and once Jay was able to win the match um fair and square to qualify to be on the Smackdown team he Roman Reigns got in the ring um after Daniel Bryan rolled out and he Jay told him all right you're the head of the table I know what I have to do now I'm sorry I know what I have to do now and it was so sad for me because I didn't want Jay Uso to surrender but then he didn't want to lose his place in the family so he finally surrendered and after he surrendered he proceeded to beat up on Daniel Bryan more and more and Jay Uso kept saying I understand now I understand now and then Roman Reigns was like make him understand and he beat him up and it was so sad because I'm just like Jay is now turned into this evil dude and now I guess they're gonna start some type of Samoan dynasty faction maybe I don't know but it was still intriguing and I literally feel like Roman and Jay deserve to be nominated for a primetime Emmy for their acting work because their performances over these past couple of weeks leading into you know that first match they had at Clash of Champions then into Hell in the Cell and then now with him aligning with him this is some of the best acting I've ever seen out of them and it's just great and I just need I want I don't understand why shows like W like Raw and Smackdown and NXT aren't ever you know thrown in the running for mainstream television awards like this but I feel like they really need to be and if they really if they ever were thrown into the ring for that then Roman Reigns and Jey Uso would be a dead ringer for it so that's all for our weekly recap and now we're going to go to the conclusion okay so I want to thank you for listening to this new episode of the second season of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. 
Um, I missed being away, but I need to take some time to just take a breather because I've been going so hard um, with the first season and I had so many and I had 30 episodes and stuff. And I was just trying to decide how to, you know, make the podcast go forward and all the new things and sort of brainstorm some more ideas as to how, you know, to move the podcast forward. Um, I hope that I can continue to give you good stories and great interviews and help you, you know, sort of, you know, navigate this crazy world that I'm in love with, which is professional wrestling. Um, If there's any um, shows that you want me to cover or any type of old stuff that you want me to cover you know don't hesitate to message me um my instagram handle is at hardy wrestling podcast and my um twitter handle is at hardy wrestle pod um and you can follow me on facebook at hardy wrestling with stephanie hardy because it still has that old name and i'm trying to change it but i can't um and you can always message me and ask me any wrestling questions that you want or whatever or you know you can make some requests or something and don't hesitate to do that i'm also still selling my chill positive and passionate t-shirts um for twenty dollars um if you want one don't hesitate to message me about those they come in the colors of black and white and you can order from sizes small to extra large and you could just tell me if you want one and stuff um and i'll have it made and and shipped out as soon as i can um because I'm really busy and stuff with life and work and stuff. So thank you so much for supporting the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. And I also want to thank Thunder Rosa for coming on the show. Um, I'm really grateful that she was able to, you know, talk to someone like me who's starting off in this world, you know, who just started this podcast in February and now it's October and I'm talking to someone like her. I'm so grateful for it. And I, you know, wish her nothing but the best in her wrestling career. So thank you for supporting me and listening to the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. And until next time, bye, y'all.